Hi, today we will have a basic introduction to async and await the new keywords introduced in Python 3. Welcome to arunrocks.com screencast. I am Arun Ravindran. Python has introduced some new keywords which has improved the performance of networking code quite significantly but it can be very confusing. So today I have a screencast in which we try to understand what async and await does and how to use it. Okay, now I'm going to show you how to write a very simple coroutine function. Let's start with the async keyword, which is the main difference. And I'm just going to print a greeting message, a very loud howdy. And that's it. So now we have defined a function named hi and which prints howdy when you call it. Let's call it and return uh, the whatever returns we are going to assign it to a variable named o. So the function returned successfully, but you notice that nothing got printed. So this function was not executing actually. It just returned something. Let's see what it returned. It returned a coroutine object. What is the type of this object? Sorry. So it's a type of coroutine. So now uh, you notice that the word coroutine is used in two instances. The coroutine object is sometimes called a coroutine, but let's keep them separate. Whatever is returned is an instance. So let's call it a coroutine object. How do we check whatever is returned is a coroutine or not? We have something called an inspect module for Python types. Uh, and this inspect module has a coroutine check called is coroutine. And we pass this coroutine object. It says it's a coroutine object. Now, once we got this coroutine object, the question becomes, how do we actually print this message? How do we actually execute uh, this high function. The answer lies in sending uh, of a, a particular uh, message to this coroutine object. So what actually happened when you called high was that this function got called and it's suspended at the beginning. So how to make how or in other words, it got paused, how to make it unpause. For that, uh, we need to send something. So let's look at what methods are contained within the returned instant object, uh, coroutine instance. So you can see that there are many internal class methods which start with double underscore. Uh, they're called the dunder methods. The most important one I would like you to see is this particular function called send. This class method is the one which will actually start execution of this program. But before we send something, I want you to notice that our function is not having a return statement. So once it prints some output or this greeting, it just falls through. So it immediately has to return. But we don't have a way of returning out of uh, um, a coroutine cleanly, which we'll see in a moment. So let me send none, which is usually the way in which you execute the coroutine. You just send a none in the beginning just to kickstart things. Okay. Finally, we have our greeting printed. It actually printed it and we also got an exception. The exception is, uh, for some reason called stop iteration. Uh, the actual reason behind it is uh, coroutines uh, were internally implemented like generators and generators, as you know, are used for iteration. And at the end of an iteration, it actually says stop iteration. However, coroutines are different from generators. They're used for different purposes, but internal implementations show this uh, uh, fact that it's actually using a stop iteration. How do we prevent an exception 
when we want to execute a coroutine. So for that, we should actually write our own event loop or we can use an existing event loop. Python standard library provides us the async IO uh, coroutine, uh, uh, event loops. Sorry. Uh, let's uh, look at what is the default event loop which is provided by async io and use that default event loop to execute our high function so once again uh, so here we are trying to get the default event loop it's called get event loop now the loop has a function called run until complete. So before that, let's do the same thing we did before. Let's call hi and create a coroutine object. And let's use this coroutine object and try to execute it again. But this time we are going to do it inside the async IO event loop. Run until complete. And I'm going to pass this coroutine object. Perfect. Now we have executed the same function again, but without the error messages because the event loop has handled the stop iteration exception cleanly. So that is why coroutines are generally triggered by event loops and event loops are the ones which actually drives a coroutine. Okay. Now we have understood what async does. Let's try to understand what the await keyword does. So coroutines are not supposed to block each other. Their real function uh, or their real purpose is to use, use it for IO operations, which are, which can potentially block if you run it in synchronously, but asynchronous code will not block each other. So let's write a new async function. I'm going to call it sleep. And now I'm going to use the await keyword for a sleep. So you have three seconds. So notice that the await keyword calls a blocking function. So sleep is going to block you for three seconds, but in this case, it might not. Again, I'm going to call it Again, it returns immediately without actually executing it or without delaying it for three seconds. Let's see what it returns when you send a none. I'm going to keep the return value in a function. Let's see what happens when you call it with this. So we got something what is called a future. This future is different from what we got earlier. So remember we have an await call here and this is calling a sleep function. And this coroutine is actually what is returning this future. The type is of asyncio.future. The functions or the class methods of this are different from what we saw earlier. So there are three main things to note here. In a future, you actually have in what state is it is in, whether it is done, whether it's completed, whether it is canceled. It also has the result stored in it. You also can add some callbacks. So just like a timer in JavaScript, you can add a callback to see whether the future got completed. If it gets completed, immediately call a callback. So now we are not going to use that uh, those functions. Uh, as before, we are going to run uh, the same function inside a event loop to see what happens when we actually use the await keyword. So again, I'm going to call run until complete. And you notice that it is waiting. 
So it waited for three seconds and it returned the function. Essentially what is happening is it calls sleep. It calls the async IO sleep. It returns to the event loop. The event loop is sleeping or waiting for uh, three seconds. And after three seconds, the event loop again unsuspends the function from this point onwards. To understand this a bit more clearly, let's create more sleeping functions. To understand what happens when a coroutine sleeps, you have to have more than one coroutine, which is what I've tried to do here. This is a very small program which actually creates a sleeper function and uh, it is very similar to what we saw before except that this sleeper function you can pass a name which is which is returned at the end you can pass a delay which is how many seconds the async io is going to sleep and how many times you want to repeat it since the repetition uh, will be actually printed I just want to uh, show it as a range. So the range will, instead of starting from zero to repeat minus one, this will actually start from one to repeat plus one so that the counting starts from one. It looks better when you print it. However, this program is just going to start the event loop. It's just going to create uh, the core routine called sleeper. And instead of run and directly calling run until complete, <clears throat> I'm going to call gather. The reason I'm going to use gather is I'm going to call more than one coroutine. So if you're just having one coroutine, you can use run until complete. If you have more than one coroutine, it's better to use gather so that the gathering combines the result, uh, the futures of multiple coroutines and makes it into a single future, which you can pass to run until complete. When you execute this, you'll notice that there's not much of an output. You don't see what is going on. So it's going to create a sleeper named A, make it delay for six seconds and just do it for once. So the loop is just going to end after one, one um, repetition. When you run this, this essentially sleeps for six seconds and then it ends you don't get to see what is happening inside. So for that, I made another version of this program, which has a lot of logging statements, which basically print statements. Um, you can see it here. So it's the exact same program with a lot of logging added to it. The first uh, three lines at the top or the lines, at, these three lines actually configures the logging module it gets a logger and it sets the logging level to info. Um, you also see some log statements inserted before the await statement. So before you start the sleep, before you await the sleep, there is a start. You actually print that it's this named sleeper is starting and it started the first repetition out of n number of repetitions and it's going to wait for x uh, n a delay number of seconds. Same thing when it ends. And similarly, we have uh, some logging functions which tell you when the run until before, just before the run until complete starts and just after the run until complete ends. Let's see what happens when we run this. Sorry about that. So when you start it, it says uh, it's starting A, one out of one iterations, waited for six seconds, it ended it and it ended after six seconds. So, uh, so far we just have one coroutine. I'm just going to add two, two more coroutines. I'm going to just copy the exact same lines here. And I'm just going to add another sleeper named B, which will sleep for two seconds and have three iterations. So total of six seconds. Uh, I think I mistyped it, sleeper. 
and one more sleeper called C which will sleep only for half a second but 12 times again it will have six second total delay so if you notice all three sleepers have six seconds and we have added it to a future now let's run this future and we we expect to see all these three sleepers to be executed asynchronously let's see what happens notice how a b c are interleaved it's not like a has started and it's waiting for a to complete it has gone ahead and started c as well and b as well and now c ends first because it's just 5.5 a second 0.5 seconds and again c starts the second iteration of the loop out of 12 iterations and so on and so forth so c is much more frequent and b is also even uh, more frequent than a and towards the end you can see that a ends b ends and c ends and the output is a b c which is basically what gather has returned uh, by combining the return values of all the three coroutines so the main thing to notice is that even if each of these coroutines have a blocking sleep function they are not blocking each other in fact they are cooperative they are uh, this is a form of cooperative multi-threading uh, they are cooperating to execute each other by uh, suspending their execution and uh, resuming the execution whenever the uh, blocking function is complete okay now let's look at what happens when you call a coroutine within a coroutine so i'm going to have i've written a function here with some basic basic logging so if you don't have the logging essentially what it happens is there is a main function which calls the grandfather function. So the grandfather coroutine is run until complete. The grandfather coroutine just awaits the father coroutine over here. So the father coroutine just awaits the child coroutine and the child coroutine is sleeping for three seconds and then it returns. Uh, what I'm trying to show here is a series of nested calls to coroutines. Uh, and when one coroutine calls another coroutine, it uses the await keyword so that it does not block or uh, uh, you know, cause the event loop to be delayed. Uh, this is a major uh, structuring mechanism for uh, writing asynchronous programs using async IO. You should uh, if you're going to use, if you're going to call a blocking function like an IO uh, input output, uh, you should always use the await keyword and call that coroutine so that that function is not executed synchronously, but executed asynchronously and the await ensures that it's suspended and the control goes back to the event loop. Let's run this. So you can see that the wait has started. The grandfather started first, then it called the father, then it called the child. Then it got suspended for three seconds. And then the child returned, the grandfather returned, the father returned, and then the grandfather returned. So this is a form of chaining. Um, the chain starts at the event loop end. The event loop drives uh, the asynchronous program. It called the grandfather and it cascade uh, the calls cascaded until it reached a blocking uh, operation and then the control went back to the event loop and the event loop resumes the uh, suspended coroutines so all the three coroutines were suspended uh, when the blocking operation has completed and then just like a function call returns the nested function uh, the nested coroutines have returned mm -hmm.